Hi, I'm Tucson Morrison with Onside Public Media, and I'm interviewing Nikema Levy Armstrong about question two. Nikema, can you let the people know who you are and what you do? Yes, I'm Nikema Levy Armstrong. I am a civil rights attorney, activist, former president of the Minneapolis NAACP, former law professor, and I'm also the founder of the Racial Justice Network. I never knew you the former president of the Minneapolis NAACP. Yes. Okay. Learn something new every day. <laughs> My goodness. Um, yeah. So we're here to talk about question two, and that is coming up on the ballot for Minneapolis. And as it's described uh, by Ballotpedia, and correct me if I'm wrong, a yes, votes, a yes vote supports this charter amendment to replace the Minneapolis Police Department with the Department of Public Safety, DPS, have the mayor nominate and the city council approve a person to serve as DPS commissioner and remove language from the Minneapolis city charter on the police department, including minimum police funding requirements and the mayor's control of the police department. A no vote opposes this charter amendment, thus maintaining the existing structure of the Minneapolis police department. Uh, what does this question mean to you? And, and, and how did we get here? So we're in a situation right now in Minneapolis where we have an opportunity to determine the future of the Minneapolis Police Department and whether there will be a future Minneapolis Police Department. There is a proposed public safety charter amendment that is focused on, um, I would say, redistributing power. So right now, the mayor has oversight of the Minneapolis Police Department along with the chief, but the mayor is responsible. This proposed public safety charter amendment would divide power between the mayor and 13 city council members. Some people are dismissive of the implications of that. However, that is a huge shift from what we currently have in place, uh, where the person who is in charge of the Department of Public Safety will have to answer to not one boss, but 14 bosses. Wow. And for those who don't think it's a big deal, imagine you having to go to work and answer to 14 bosses, right? This is 14 bosses who represent different parts of the city of Minneapolis, um, different levels of affluence and privilege, different racial and ethnic demographics, having to come together um, during times of emergencies and non-emergencies and make decisions that are in the best interest of residents of Minneapolis. I feel that it is a disaster in the making based on what I have already seen from the mayor and the city council members in Minneapolis. Now, why do you believe it's a disaster Like all, from what you've already seen? What have you already seen? What I've seen is a lot of infighting, unfortunately. I've seen a lot of division. And what I see um, with this particular amendment is that it's a power play on the part of city council members as opposed to really drilling down and taking a deep look into the current structure of the Minneapolis Police Department, um, pushing for an audit of the department and trying to make decisions that are strategic and based upon evidence, research, information and um, input from the community. That is not what is happening here. If we go back to June of 2020, that was uh, a few weeks after George Floyd was killed nine of our 13 city council members went to Powderhorn Park um, in South Minneapolis, which is a predominantly white so-called progressive area. And they made a declaration that they were going to dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. Now they made this declaration in front of, again, a predominantly white audience yeah. that has not been impacted uh, to the degree of black people and other people of color. Um, with uh, police violence and community violence. And they made this declaration without conducting any research, without uh, consulting experts, without even going to the black community or other communities of color to find out how people wanted to address the issues within the Minneapolis Police Department. And when they went to Powderhorn Park, what it did was shifted the conversation and made them the focal point of the murder of George Floyd, when the reality is that their uh, incompetence and also failure to address the ongoing and underlying issues within the Minneapolis Police Department contributed to the murder of George Floyd. Suddenly, the, the uh, Minneapolis City Council was able to garner national and international headlines with talk of dismantling MPD and um, 
giving people the impression that they were extremely progressive. When um, I would argue, as a matter of fact, that their failure to adhere to so-called progressive principles contributed to the Minneapolis Police Department um, having a number of excessive force complaints and engaging in egregious behavior. So I'll give a, a quick example. If we think back to uh, a year or two before George Floyd was killed, there was an issue with uh, Minneapolis police allegedly coercing EMTs, so medical professionals, into giving people, um, I think it's pronounced ketamine. Ketamine? Ketamine. Yeah. And uh, ketamine is a date rape drug. And essentially, when this was uncovered by the Minneapolis Department of Civil Rights, the city had a chance to take action. As I recall, the mayor, Jacob Fry, made a decision to hire Sally Yates, um, who is a prominent uh, attorney who was in Washington, um, to investigate uh, th this, these allegations around the um, inappropriate use of ketamine. And what happened in that situation was rather than the city council agreeing to have a third party independent investigation, they essentially decided that they weren't going to spend the money to look into this scandal. And as a result, from my understanding, those officers haven't been disciplined. The public hasn't received a report or any information um, about how that situation was handled. And again, this is the same city council that's now saying, trust us, um, we deserve control over the Minneapolis Police Department. Okay. Well, that sounds like uh, the wrap of this interview. You've explained everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just, I mean, but I have that's a few more one questions. clear example, right? It is. It is. It totally is. How it, do it, you cancel, you know, the possibility of a contract with someone who would rigorously look into these allegations? Exactly. Exactly. Kind of, kind of correct me along the way, or if you, if you, if you'd like to. But how we got here, uh, May twenty fifth, twenty twenty, George Floyd was murdered by Minneapolis police. Um, there was an uprising, if you call it, or, or a, 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 you know, a, a mass movement afterwards that was happening beforehand, but was obviously a little more active afterwards. And then this call to defund the police came to. And I was, I was there, we were there filming at Powderhorn Park, and it was not only predominantly white, I would almost say, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say all white, there were obviously some people of color there, but it, it was overwhelmingly mm -hmm. white. Um, and there was, you know, a lot of you know, um, celebration and, and applause for what the city council was saying. Uh, and I want to go back to something you said during your, your forum on question two for, uh, on the Racial Justice Network. You said, I don't trust the city council to have the best interests of black people in mind. Um, wh why is that? And, and what has been the example or the history that they've displayed over time that has led you to that, um, the notion that you, they don't have the best interests of black people in mm -hmm. mind? Well, I think that all we need to do is look at the disparities in mm -hmm. the city of Minneapolis and the departments yeah. that the city council currently has control over yeah. and whether they've been able to effectively manage those departments and produce outcomes mm -hmm. that are in the best interest of black people and other people of color. We haven't seen that happen. What we've yeah. seen is a lot of dysfunction. We've mm -hmm. seen infighting. We've mm -hmm. seen kicking the can down the road and blaming other people. Mm -hmm. We even saw one city council member pretend that he didn't know that the focus of the Powderhorn Park meeting was to defund the police, saying he didn't see the signs that he was duped. The one city council member said that, you know, the defund the police rally was just in spirit. It wasn't right. actually. They've said quite a few things yeah. um, where they backtracked. Right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. where's the backbone? And exactly. You, you need that. So this question, too, one could say, hey, this is the backbone. You know, we're going to create DPS, Department of Public Safety. We're going to, you know, uh, put in mental health workers in places that police in places police shouldn't be, you know, they, one could say this is the backbone. What would you say to that? I would say that if it's a backbone, then it should have a plan and some substance. We haven't seen a plan. Mm -hmm. And it's been 18 months since okay. nearly 18 months since George Floyd was killed. And Why haven't we seen a plan that we could look at? Why haven't they done research on what they're proposing? They essentially pulled this idea for the new public safety department out of thin air mm -hmm. without doing their homework, without laying the groundwork, without engaging the very people who will be most likely impacted mm -hmm. and without a track record 
that shows consistency in terms of being able to address any issues that impact black people, indigenous people, and other people of color mm -hmm. within the city of Minneapolis. They also do not have any depth of knowledge with regard to the system of policing or even the functioning within the Minneapolis Police Department. Mm -hmm. So you say the people that are most likely impacted, and then you also mentioned black and indigenous people. Uh, there was no, I remember you saying this uh, some time ago when we were talking about the CDD, plans about us without, without us, us. Yes. without it. Has anybody on the north side or, or you live on the north side been, um, you know, called to the table to discuss what this plan could be or what it, what it should be about? Not to my knowledge, no. Um, I was contacted by um, Steve Fletcher, who is the third ward city council member yeah. um, within a couple of weeks after the incident at Powderhorn Park. Okay. And essentially I was contacted to try to get me on board and to get my buy-in. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, I would like to meet with you and any other city council members and bring other members from the black community so we can ask questions. We did that. We went to Zion Baptist Church. We met with Steve Fletcher and uh, Jeremiah Ellison. And we asked them questions about what kind of outreach they had done within the black community. And essentially they hadn't done any. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, how did we get here? How did we go from George Floyd being killed yeah. to you all standing in Powderhorn Park saying you were going to dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department? To an overwhelmingly white audience. Exactly. Yeah. And Jeremiah Ellison said that he tweeted about it. And I said, what? You tweeted about it? And he said, yes. I tweeted that I wanted to dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department and a member of Black Visions Collective responded and said, we can help you with that. And that's what got the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. So as a resident of North Minneapolis, who lives in a predominantly black community that experiences disproportionate rates of community violence and police violence, I was flabbergasted mm -hmm. that all of this started with the tweet and not as something that was organic in the community. Um, and also not something that was based on all of the concerns along with recommendations that we have been making over the years mm -hmm. in order to transform the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, Jeremiah and several of the other city council members never really took a strong interest in addressing these underlying issues. Can we transform the Minneapolis Police Department without voting yes for Minneapolis? I believe that we can, but I think that the same energy that people had in Powderhorn Park for dismantling the Minneapolis Police Department, mm -hmm. they're gonna ha have to bring to City Hall. Imagine if those same individuals who showed up there cheering about something maybe that they felt looked progressive yeah. brought that energy all along when it comes to standing up for what is right and trying to hold police accountable. We haven't seen that energy. We haven't seen that level of engagement. Mm -hmm. And that should give people an inkling that when the dust settles after November 2nd, who's going to be there trying to pick up the pieces and ensure that the city makes decisions that are in the best interest of uh, communities of color. It's certainly not going to be those folks cheering in Powderhorn Park. I can say this from experience as someone who has been a part of this movement for a very long time. It's been a small group of people who've been consistent about pounding the pavement, um, showing up at City Hall, um, disrupting uh, the status quo um, and bringing about change. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that will still be the case after November 2nd. You say from experience, you, you've been doing this for quite some time. And my question would be, the, the, just to put it into perspective, this plan was put together, I would say, in, obviously in less than 18 months, because it's been that amount of time since Floyd was murdered, uh, probably within a year. How much time would we need to actually put together a plan and have outreach to black communities, indigenous communities, a lot of communities to actually put together a plan to transform the Minneapolis Police Department. I think a year would have been enough time, okay. right? Because okay. this isn't something that has to happen in a vacuum, right? Okay. There are companies that actually come in and audit police departments. Mm -hmm. They do um, an, an audit from top to bottom, like the number of officers, the structure, like yeah. in terms of um, the hierarchy and the chain of command, the policies and they engage the community. Yeah. We didn't have that happen here. Okay, so we, we did have enough time, but the, just the, the attention or outreach was not put in is what you're saying. There, I, I think that what this group who is pushing for this charter amendment was hoping to do was to capitalize off of 
the energy that flowed after George Floyd was killed in mm -hmm. terms of people deciding they finally want to change. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the groundwork was never laid. You cannot just take energy and there's no plan, nothing for people to look at, no substance to know what they're voting for. Yeah. And no inkling as to the potential consequences of hastily making a decision like this without having adequate information and input. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happened here. So what are people actually voting on? Right. We know the skeletal aspects yeah. of what they're voting on, like the power shift, the change in, to the charter of the minimum um, number of, uh, of officers. Those are two um, of the key aspects of this plan, a new Department of Public Safety that will essentially eliminate the job of Chief Arredondo as well. Okay. Right. But we don't know the substance of what will actually happen and whether this will set us back even further yeah. if it turns out to be a disaster because the groundwork hasn't been laid uh -huh. and the work hasn't been done leading up to this point. In reality, we really should have had a range of options to consider mm -hmm. based on best practices from other jurisdictions that have been effective based on evidence-based practices, using our data to help uh, make decisions and um, decide the best course of action. And of course, community engagement, outreach, and input, which did not happen. Mm -hmm. And so how do we vote on something when there's no substance to it? Mm -hmm. How can energy and momentum carry you forward and you're, you don't have adequate information? Mm -hmm. Well, so some people might be saying that are watching this right now, hey, you know, like, like the, the folks from MPD 150 have been working on policy change for some time saying, you know, actually we have researched this and we have put in the work. What would you say to that? Well, I would say that those people are not the folks who um, put this uh, language together and said specifically, this is what needs to happen, right? I'm not mm -hmm. talking about research specifically surrounding the MPD and how it mm -hmm. has operated. I'm talking about evidence-based practices that have to do with how do you overhaul or transform a police department? Mm -hmm. That work hasn't been done. Okay. And those dots haven't been connected. Mm -hmm. You know, we have groups who've done a lot of research as well, and many of them don't support what's happening here with this proposed charter yeah. amendment. I can think of one particular group that's been around for about 20 years. Yeah, and like, Communities United Against Police Brutality. We, we interviewed Michelle Gross, who from the get was saying this is, this is, not, this is not a good idea. Right. Um, it's a disaster in the making. I can say that with confidence. And also, you, you mentioned redistributing power. When we talk about uh, the Department of Public Safety, if, if, it is, if this is created, does that sound like a power grab to, to create like a new job for, for you know, community, uh, uh, city council members? Um, or what, is, what does that look like to you? Because the second I saw it, I was like, Department of Public Safety, okay. And then who leads that? Who, who is in charge of that? Someone who is likely not going to be a law enforcement officer. Okay. Or have a law enforcement background. So then how does that relate? That's specifically written in. So how does that relationship then work? You know, Who it, knows how it works? There's no plan to know how it's going to work. I haven't seen it done before. I've heard people compare this new quote unquote Department of Public Safety to the state Department of Public Safety. Okay. Which does not regulate the behavior of police officers. Okay. Then, then, so why, I, I don't, I honestly can't, I, I can't fathom why they're taking this approach without mm -hmm. again, no data, mm -hmm. no research, yeah. no input from experts, no input from community. Mm -hmm. What are we getting? We don't know. So I'll point out the, the big thing that we kind of brought up in the beginning was lack of outreach to black communities. And for me, that seems to be the main, it, it seems to be a very large factor. It should be a large factor in this decision. Mm -hmm. Communities that are impacted by uh, Gun violence and, and law enforcement, gun violence which stems from stratification, economic disparity, lack of resources. It's not just in a vacuum. People are like, oh, I'm going to be evil, you know, or whatever. But the, the, to address the roots of gun violence and law enforcement, police brutality, why is, the, why is that community not brought to, 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 the, to, the, to the center of this discussion? Why, why do you believe that is? Because we've been told time and time again that our voices don't matter and mm -hmm. our experiences don't matter. And also told that our lives don't matter. Exactly. Yeah. And if a small group of us hadn't consistently been out in the streets for the last several years, mm -hmm. we would still be treated as if we didn't matter. Okay. Right. So 
the folks who are saying that they're going to vote yes on this charter amendment mm -hmm. may not necessarily have to live in and with the consequences of that decision. It's going to be the black community mm -hmm. and other communities of color that are most heavily impacted by mm -hmm. this decision. Yeah. You have to have a comprehensive strategy mm -hmm. that looks at the real issues of crime and gun violence, that looks at the real issues of problems within policing and has the, the um, w well-being of the entire community in mind, but mm -hmm. with specific attention to those who are disproportionately impacted. We haven't seen that. That hasn't been a part of this discussion. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a part of the strategy um, leading up to this proposed public safety charter amendment. And I feel that people are being manipulated in this process, right? They're b basically being told to take almost like a patronizing attitude um, towards looking at this issue and treating black folks like our voices don't matter, like our mm -hmm. experiences don't matter like our lives don't matter. Mm -hmm. You're still putting the power in the hands of the white majority to decide our fate. And regarding, um, and I guess regarding that, the, the one thing that comes to mind is somebody who's watching this could say, oh, if you're not in approval of question two, then you're pro-cop, um, wh I, which I don't necessarily believe, but what, how, do you, how do you feel about it's kind of either or in this situation? I think that it's a fallacy. Right. Okay. It's a false dichotomy mm -hmm. to say that if you vote no, you want to keep the system the same. If you vote yes, you want to radically transform the system. When the reality is what is consistent is that everyone wants change. Yeah. The question is, how do we get there in a way that is responsible mm -hmm. and in a way that will not do more harm than what we're already experiencing? Mm -hmm. The folks who are saying yes can't answer that because they haven't laid the groundwork, they haven't done the research, nor do they have the track record yeah. in terms of being able to produce the kind of changes that are needed. It's easy to show up to a party, right, when everything's been decorated, yeah. all the food is out, yeah. you know, someone else has done the legwork and mm -hmm. you just sit there and enjoy the fruit and then take credit for that being your party, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that would be an easy thing to do. Right, but the hard work is actually looking at these systems, um, analyzing what is happening, um, pushing for the policy changes that are necessary, lighting a fire under elected officials, and having a well thought out plan, again, so that you don't do more harm to impacted communities. That's my number one concern about what's happening here, mm -hmm. that the plight of black folks and other people of color are being disregarded in this process. Okay. And, and I, I definitely, I, I can see that, especially from the forum that you held with Racial Justice Network with a, a, uh, a, you know, a, a lot of uh, black folks at the table that are leaders in the community. Does, the, does question two, for me, the, the heart of a lot of the disparities and problems and you know, police brutality being, you know, giving permission to you know, do whatever, starts at the union. Does question two affect the union at all? The police union? It's hard to say because there's state laws in place as well, right? Okay, they can't yeah. answer that. So we don't know okay. what the real impact will be. We know they will have cops. Yeah. But whether they're under a union contract, whether the state takes up, we don't know. Those mm -hmm. questions haven't been answered. Why? Because there's no plan. Okay. And uh, I think the union is one part of it, right? So there is the police federation that has played a role in terms of how we got here, but it's also elected officials not being accountable and being responsible and addressing the very real concerns of the Minneapolis Police Department. And those elected officials include the mayor and the city council members. Uh, you mentioned in your forum as well that the city council voted to give uh, Justine uh, Damon Ruchek, uh, their, her family, $20 million when, uh, after she was killed by uh, a black cop, which is a white woman. Um, there was no footage um, and there, there was there, there was, they just, just gave the family $20 million, which I believe is one of the largest settlements, civil settlements. It was the largest in history in Minnesota. At, at the time. At, at the, the time, time yep. Um, and they even designated $2 million of that 20 to go to the Minneapolis Foundation. Okay. Which and, is another slap in the face, from yeah. my perspective, to have a predominantly white organization. That's R.T. Ryback's found, yes. foundation? Yeah. yeah, well, he's the president. The former mayor, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, did not know that. Um, yes, that was a part of the negotiating that happened. Wow. 
Yeah, which I called out at the time and said this is unacceptable, that a largely white, very wealthy uh, foundation is going to get a portion of funds yeah. um, related to police violence when it is the black community that is largely suffering the most, you yeah. know, yeah. Um, under the weight of oppression. And so the Minneapolis Foundation wound up getting twice as much as black victims of uh, police violence. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Justine's family getting 20 million, um, you compare that to the family of Jamar Clark that mm -hmm. got maybe 250,000. Yeah. And then the family of um, Terrence Franklin that got yeah. about 795,000. Yeah. So a combined less than 1 million for our, just over 1 million for two black men who were killed. Yeah. Um, point blank range. Point shot in the head at point blank range. It yeah. wasn't an accident. Yeah. It was intentional. Yeah. No accountability for the officers who killed these men. And the city responds by giving these black men a combined roughly one million. And not that you could equate a human life to any dollar amount, but it's the way that the city responded in measuring that 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 incident or the, those 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 acts of police violence. Because the city council did that, gave 20 million to a white family that uh, the, a, a white woman that was uh, shot by a black cop, and then doesn't give nearly the amount to pennies, a, pennies in comparison, pennies to, on to, the to, to, to black families that were shot and killed by, uh, I believe, white officers. What what is that? How does that same city council, if that if that city council is willing to do that? What, does that impact how you feel about this decision to, for question two Absolutely. with the same city council? It's disingenuous okay. to say that they're going to um, dismantle MPD and create a new Department of Public Safety yeah. that takes our concerns and issues in, in, into account. Evidence shows that they haven't done that when mm -hmm. they've had the opportunity on many occasions. I mm -hmm. um, have a few questions here. We just kind of wrote up before going into this. Um, the advocates for this amendment say that it's needed to do things like add mental health responders. If so, don't we need to vote for something like that? What do we need to vote for if mental health responders are going to be in this plan or not? Why did they need to create a whole new Department of Public Safety with no plan in order to add mental health responders? From my understanding, there have already been pilots in place regarding having um, folks who are trained in a mental health response go out to calls, right? Which I believe in. And we actually asked for, for North Minneapolis, our community was bypassed when those initial plans were made. And we mm -hmm. put pressure on city council to say North Minneapolis has been crying out for mental health responders. Why didn't the program start here and those resources be allocated here? We still didn't get a satisfactory response, Yeah. right? And so, and we also don't know the data from the pilots that are in place in order to determine what's actually needed mm -hmm. moving forward. So this is not about, the, again, this is a false dichotomy that's been presented um, in terms of the way that this is being framed. What we're asking for is due diligence and a well thought out comprehensive plan, Okay. right? And that hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. And so it's being framed as, oh, you don't want change if you don't vote for this. No, I want to make sure we're being responsible Mm -hmm. that we are considering the impacts of our decisions so that we're not here five years from now looking at the unintended consequences for voting yes on number two. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And if you don't do your homework, you don't do research, you don't consult experts, you don't consult the community. Mm -hmm. That's what is being set up to happen. Yeah. And our people are the ones who are going to suffer the brunt of these decisions, just as we did after George Floyd was killed. Mm -hmm. When I warned Jeremiah Ellison um, of the fallout that was going to happen from going to Powderhorn Park and saying they were going to dismantle MPD. Mm -hmm. I said, Jeremiah, you're going to turn Minneapolis into the wild, wild west. You're going to give people the impression that no one's in charge. And almost immediately after that, we started seeing an increase in shootings, carjackings and all kinds of things, right, that are in part attributed to what happened at Powderhorn Park. We know that the pandemic also played a role. Of course. Yeah. Um, as well as just the normal ebb and flow of crime. But this was something that didn't have to happen if they had focused more on taking a holistic approach and doing the research than trying to garner national and international headlines to look more progressive. Um, and to, to kind of follow up with the idea of there's no plan, 
Some say there's no plan, but the advocates for yes for Minneapolis say the council was prohibited from making a plan because they were told it would be an unethical promotion of a ballot initiative. How could they have come up with a plan? Well, I know that people are claiming that, but if we recall um, before this most recent amendment was put forward, there were city council members who had drafted a similar amendment and they wound up opting out and saying, well, just go with that language for those who propose the mm -hmm. public safety charter amendment. The reality is that even before this was decided to be put on the ballot, they could have been coming up with the plan. They could have been coming up with the plan since Powderhorn Park happened, mm -hmm. before Powderhorn Park happened, and they have nothing to show mm -hmm. in all that time. And now they want to <clears throat> cover the, because I believe them trying to cover themselves politically mm. is a part of why they stepped away from the language and said, we don't need this, you know, yeah. additional, um, <laughs> these additional um, p potential political attacks that some of them that, you know, felt that they faced. Yeah. We want to be safe to try to re secure our seats mm -hmm. in the next election. So let them handle it. They're well funded. Mm -hmm. Right. These organizations have tens of millions of dollars that they collected off of the back of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. They have national organizations helping to support their work financially yeah. as well as technical support. Yeah. And they were better resourced than the city council. But they're in, in cahoots together to bring mm -hmm. this forward. So they can't now hide their hands after they threw the ball in the first place. Well, I heard the, the, the now president of the city council, Lisa Bender, say several times, hey, I'm working with these groups. I'm working with these mm -hmm. groups that- Absolutely. Um, yeah, so she took pride in working with these groups and going on CNN and other national outlets and sadly looking really ignorant, mm -hmm. in part because she has no knowledge about policing. If you look at her city council page where she talks about um, her interest in her work. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about policing. It was about bike lanes and other things mm -hmm. that um, primarily white middle class folks, you know, are focused on, mm -hmm. right? And so her connection with these groups, her involvement in helping to orchestrate Powderhorn Park um, has played a role in mm -hmm. how we got here, yeah. right? And so when I talk about manipulation, this is another example of that. You have the city council partnering with groups who hadn't been out there doing the work and doing the heavy lifting and saying, we're going to take these drastic steps, but you have done nothing in between and mm -hmm. nothing since mm -hmm. to actually give people confidence that you have the capability and the ability to address these issues. And if I recall correctly, um, Lisa Bender at one point had to call the police because of some structure that was placed near her home after a demonstration. She blamed protesters for that, including me, even mm -hmm. though I had zero to do with it. Yeah. And then called the police. And I'm like, why are you calling the police after you told white people on Twitter that if they support this, then they definitely can't call 911. Like yeah. shaming white folks yeah. who may need to call 911, then you had to call because somebody put a structure down, down the street from your house. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, Seems very duplicitous. And then you ran and decided not to run for re-election after you've dug a hole. Now yeah. you want to run and go live your best life. And we're left to deal with the consequences. Of, of her decisions. Over of the her past, decisions over, over and the career. other council members' decisions, right? Yeah. And another one who also decided to run from this controversy mm -hmm. and not run for re-election. Yeah. Right? This is the character of some of the people we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. The, the, the last question on this is some are really excited for this amendment because they think it's the only way we break the Minneapolis Police Federation and get a better contract, get a better contract, one that enables community policing. Shouldn't we just do that? Well, those folks who are saying this is our one opportunity clearly haven't rolled up their sleeves and done the heavy lifting yeah. <laughs> to help us get to this point, yeah. right? This is it. Last I've, train, I've leave the station. I've heard that this is our own. I'm like, do you guys think this was a magical moment that fell out of the sky? No. Or were people out there pounding the pavement, raising awareness, putting their bodies and lives and livelihoods on the line it, in light of the bloodshed out at the hands of the police and the mm -hmm. violence that was going on to help us get here? Yeah. So I see this as a marathon and not a sprint. Yeah. And I also see this as an opportunity to not only ask the questions, but to do the actual groundwork that it takes to bring about change. You mm -hmm. can't just snap your fingers and suddenly you have a 
a new situation, it's going to take a lot of hard work and heavy Absolutely. lifting and a lot of questions right now that they can't answer. Mm. I've seen a lot of uh, false promises thrown out of what if we could take, you know, 90 million and do this and that. Well, what if we could? We can wish upon a star all day long, but the proof is in the pudding. Yeah. And we don't have anything to look at that guarantees any of what's been promised, mm -hmm. even, including the number of officers that might be a part of this new department, right? Mm -hmm. This city council um, were the same folks who on the one hand claim we needed fewer police, mm -hmm. that when the pressure increased and people started calling and complaining, expended more resources yeah. for more police. Yeah, they voted millions. to give half a million dollars. Oh, I mean, yeah, millions, yeah. Right, yeah. so why couldn't they, if they cared about having more mental health professionals, yeah. Why wouldn't they have allocated those resources then? Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to act like we have to sign up and jump on a moving train and not know the destination to get change is ludicrous. Mm -hmm. Those are the same folks who, when we were bringing these concerns years and years and years and years um, to get them to move, sat on their butts and did nothing. And mm -hmm. now they're saying we've got the magic formula. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it for one bit based on what I've seen, based on what I know, and based on what my community has experienced. So looking into the future, obviously the city council is going to drastically change. I think there's more people running for city council than ever before. We have, you know, people uh, uh, falling out, Lisa Bender, Alondra Cano. The future of the city council, do you, how do you feel like the work going forward? Let's say this, this doesn't happen. What is the work going forward with this new city council? And what, what, what would you say to the new city council that's, that's going to be showing up to the, to the front line? Well, I remember interviewing um, city council members with the forums that we had. And yeah, I yeah asked many them, of them, yes. Yes, I asked one city council member who helped orchestrate all of this, if this doesn't pass, what is the plan to address policing? Yeah. That person had no answer. What's the plan to address, uh, address policing anyways? I mean, there's, there's so many places you can go. High speed chases. Uh, qualified immunity, personal liability insurance. I mean, there are a litany of things that you can address. And like, civilian oversight, right? Well, civilian oversight, huge. I mean, the, the Office of Police uh, uh, Conduct Review is, is, is abysmal. We're at like 0.42% for uh, folks getting disciplined, right. when the national average is 7 to 8%. Right. Like, Why wouldn't you dig in, though, and dive in and look at that data yeah. and be able to even articulate those numbers and that information and propose solutions? Yeah. Instead, you're saying, oh, tear that down. Let's put up a whole new system and you haven't even addressed the lack of, a, of accountability and discipline for those officers who are currently on the force. I mean, there's killer cops on the force right now. Yeah. Yeah. And we said, why don't you look at everyone's record who is currently employed at MPD and yeah. uproot those cops who have violated laws, violated policy, mm -hmm. violated people's rights and have them removed. Mm -hmm. None of that's been done. No. Right. There was even a group, Minneapolis for a better policing contract that spent hours doing painstaking research about mm -hmm. um, the police federation contract. They wrote up recommendations. They found loopholes. They found issues. We took those to city council yeah. and we let them know you need to be actively involved. You need to, first of all, read the contract, which they never do. Mm -hmm. They read a memo yeah. and then they rubber stamp what happens. Yeah. None of that's been done. Wow. Right. But you're telling people vote yes and magically we'll have a new system. It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. And the people who think it does work like that, unfortunately, are being misled. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this from a variety of perspectives. Right. As a civil rights attorney, as someone who ran for mayor on a police accountability platform mm -hmm. in 2017, as someone who taught law for 14 years and as someone who's been out in the trenches for many years, standing up and fighting alongside other dedicated people. Mm -hmm. So this is a pipe dream that's being sold to people um, based on their desire for change. And my concern is that there are going to be so many unintended consequences that we will put the black community and other communities of color in a far worse position mm -hmm. than we're in right now. Well, thank you so much for informing us on uh, your your, your history and experience throughout, you know, uh, being involved in um, community action, political change, law, uh, and, and what's brought you to the, to the point of your, your decision on the question as well. And hopefully folks will get some type of value and insight out of this interview. I hope so. Thank you, Tucson. And I just want to make clear to, to people, I want to see the Minneapolis Police Department overhauled. Mm -hmm. But I want it to be done responsibly mm -hmm. at the end of the day. It's that simple, in my opinion. 
responsible change. Me too. Thank you. Thank you.